have here is um, to answer the questions and then add uh, the timing of the of the video of where I answered the question so that people that were specifically looking for answers to that question can go back and just watch the video right there. I thought that might be helpful for people that can't join. And then the last thing is I just want to share the next event that I'm doing and that'll be it. Last time we wrapped up in like 35, 40 minutes. So whenever there's no more questions, that'll be it for the day. So without further ado, what I want to start is just introduce uh, the toolkit that I've created for problem framing. If you're here to learn about framing, I created a toolkit. Actually, I wanted to share this visual I, I found today, which I thought was interesting. It's, yeah, cool. I just found this today. It's from a platform called WalkMe, which offers like guided training through your through your software. And I thought this was interesting, this like messy learning journey that we go through. Um, the reason, and I'm sharing it because the reason that I created the toolkit was because I used to do a lot of these one day or two day workshops to teach design sprints, problem framing, facilitation. And this is definitely what I experienced, even as a participant, as well as someone teaching, people would kind of get like all rat, you know, like riled up and excited. And then they leave the workshop and they'd email me and be like, I forgot what you said, or how do I do this here? Or help my team sucks. And then I would create uh, articles and videos and sort of like give that to people over time and whatever. It would just be this sort of like really messy experience. I even created a 12 week program with my friend Daniel Stillman to try to make this not happen so much or to, to get you from here to over here somewhere. Um, and that was good, but not everybody has 12 weeks. And we charged a bunch of money for it. And not everybody wants to spend all that time. So I, I had this idea over, over a year ago to take my teaching and to put it inside of a toolkit and to make it available to you in the learning, as well as the templates and the resources and things that you could use to facilitate whatever it was I was teaching. And sort of like this combination of learning and doing in one package. And that's what became the toolkits over time as I talked to people and got them together. And so the toolkits are, get this out of my way. The toolkits have become this, um, a collection of stuff. And inside the problem framing toolkit are, you could see there's videos, all the videos are meant to be stuff like this, me recording, my ideas and instructions on how to get through a problem framing process that I've developed over time. And then there's a whole bunch of supporting materials so that as you're learning it and watching the videos and kind of like unpacking the ideas, you could start to apply it in the sessions and workshops that you're doing. Um, and so this is behind the scenes. I host the toolkit in a, in a learning management system called Podia. Um, there's a bunch of learning management systems out there. This one's great, it's been really helpful. And you can see that when you get the toolkit, by the way, I'll put this link in there, which I don't, I haven't made uh, too friendly to find. I'm struggling, hold on. So if you ever wanted to just go and explore what's in there, there's some previews, so you could watch some of the videos and stuff like that. But you see there's a whole bunch of videos there's all of these downloadables. So there's facilitation guides. Um, there's a customizable agenda, which you can use through Session Lab. If you haven't checked out Session Lab, highly recommend. Um, they have It's another great resource. Um, and then there's presentation decks. If, if you wanted to share that with the team as you were standing up in front of the room or in front of the Zoom call and, and sharing and, and facilitating. And then there's all of the digital boards. That's kind of like the, the meat and potatoes of the, the toolkits are these boards that exist inside of Miro and Mural today. I I'm talking with Envision about creating freehand versions, um, hopefully in the next, mm, hopefully this year. Um, and so that's kind of like a, just a quick eye shot of what's inside the toolkits. You see these, all these additional resources. 
things that I've learned and collected over the years of learning about framing and sort of like problem discovery. And I put those inside the toolkit as well. A couple of them are things that I've created. There's this facilitation Q&A series, which is this ongoing video series that I've been creating, facilitation mini course that I created, both free things. Um, and then a whole bunch of videos to take you through each step of my eight step problem framing process. And so um, what I'll also put in here, rather than spend a lot of time, if you guys want me to step through any of this stuff, we can come back to it. But so the toolkit originally launched in October of 2019, and I've been making small iterations here and there, but then um, in December and early January, I released a whole bunch of bigger changes. And so I decided to um, be a little bit more formal about it. And I created this release note, it's just a page on my website, just to, to um, capture all the big things that I changed based purely on research and conversations I've had with people using the toolkit. So there was a whole bunch of stuff that came out. The other thing that I'm excited that I'm working on with the help of another gentleman is to bring examples. So one question I get asked a lot is, what will it look like? What does framing look like? What projects should I use it on? Um, who should I have in there? Um, and so we're gonna try to create some examples so that it becomes more um, clear to see about what problem framing is and what it might look like for you to apply it. So there's some good stuff in there. And what else did I wanna cover? That's kind of like the toolkit stuff. And so, I'm gonna start answering some questions that's in this Miro board in here. Thank you if you added some. I'm, I'm just basically keeping these. I'm gonna use the same Miro board for each of these sessions. I hope to do these about once every two weeks or so. And I'm just gonna let this board build up with questions and then I'll start to add post-its with my notes next to them. Um, so for the rest of this time, I'm just gonna go through these questions one at a time. Um, if you have another question that comes up or if you wanna stop me as I'm answering one, just come off mute and, and we can just talk. Like I said, there's not a ton of people in here. And then um, if you have to go, actually maybe just let me switch the order really quickly. Um, if you have to jump at any point or you've heard your question and you don't feel like being here anymore, um, I wanted to share one more thing. Um, on our events page, there's another event I'm doing tomorrow. So what we'll talk about probably in part of the question and answer period is that the, the a big upfront component of my problem framing process is to prioritize, to find the problem that we're gonna unpack for the rest of the workshop. And that has become its own entity in itself called problem prioritization. And so I created a free toolkit and, and free framework for people to use and experiment. And on Friday, in two days from now, I'm doing an event to take people like through those three steps in more detail for people that are interested in that. So if you're curious, you can go to the site, newhaircut.com slash events, and you can click to sign up for that one. That's Friday at 12 Eastern. Okay, now some questions. And I'm gonna Stop sharing for a second, and I'm going to pull this up here. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm going to take the ones that got a, a few upvotes. Um, if you were here, Last time I answered some of these questions. I'm going to answer them again because I forgot to click record. So I'm going to answer them this time so that others that couldn't make it um, can hear some answers. Also, um, if you have ideas and, and um, things that you want to add to, on top of the, the ideas that I share, come off mute and, and add them in. I'm certainly not the only person in the room that knows what I'm talking about here. So, first question is what do you suggest for? convincing others. Can you all see my screen? Erica, I see you. Yeah? Okay. 
Um, so first one was from Emily. What do you suggest for convincing others that problem framing is important? Um, sorry for repeating this for the folks that were here last time, but what I've, what I've mentioned in the past is that um, to back up, the reason that we started getting into problem framing was because before that we were heavily into design sprints. We're still into design sprints, but we would get into design sprints before we were ready for a design sprint. And we didn't really have a structured designed set of conversations and activities to make sure that we were ready for a sprint. We would just kind of be in it and be like, uh oh, um, we're not really clear that this is a problem that we should be solving, or there seems to be misalignment for what this problem is all about, or who it's or who it's about, the you know, the customer, the user. Um, or altogether, we're working on a problem that just was really unimportant. And now we've gotten everybody here that used to be more costly in the, in the past, right? Planes and hotels and all that. We've gotten everybody in the room and we're having these realizations now. And that, so we talk about like, what are the possible outcomes from design sprints? And when we talk about sprint failure, that is a failure. So it's not a failure if you invalidate your ideas or you pivot or you have new experiences that come to light. Those are all great things to happen, especially in such a short time frame. What is a failure is if you get in the room and you realize you shouldn't be there or you have the wrong people there and they have to stop and you have to get new people. And so what we wanted to do is to design a process or a framework building on the principles and the energy and, and sort of the outcomes that we had experienced in sprints, a lot of facilitation and design thinking principles. And we wanted to do that outside of the sprint. And so time was one of the um, constraints that we designed the session and this, this framework around. We wanted to make sure that we could do it in a day or less because it was strategic, which meant we would probably have um, VPs and busy people and executives and stakeholders that couldn't be with us for a sprint for, for a, a multi-day process. And so the point of me sharing that story is because that one day has saved us five days. And those five days, as you, as you may know, um, inside of a sprint can save you months or years of building stuff and measuring it and learning from it and then refactoring and rebuilding altogether, which is the way a lot of groups still, still operate. So the, so the question that I ask back to people is, is one day a good use of people's time versus spending months and years arriving at the same conclusions? So the cell is in four to eight hours, we're gonna figure out what a team of people should realistically and, um, spend the next six months, 24 months working on. So when I frame it in that sense, people understand that it's not, they're not gonna be wasting their time, which is like the number one complaint or concern that people have, are you gonna waste my time? And so like by having those conversations in such short order, it's highly structured. I talk about how the outcomes from framing are gonna feed, like perfectly feed the next set of conversations, whether it's a design sprint or just some design iterations, design feedback sessions, but we'll have clarity and alignment on what everyone is excited to move forward with. So that's the way I tend to pitch or sell problem framing when people talk about it. Most of the time I'm, I'm having that conversation because, um, People are very, uh, they have a very prescri prescribed thing that they want me to come and talk about. We want you to come and do a design sprint. And when, I, and when I tell them my process for making sure that we're ready for a design sprint, I get a lot of, I get pushback as well. What are we doing in this first session up here? Why is that happening a week or two before? Can't we just figure that out on the day of the sprint? And so I'll, I'll take them through those stories of me discovering that, that in my experience, having that set of conversations before and outside separately from the sprint. It's really important, really good investment in everybody's time. Does anyone wanna dig on that some more or add on top? So uh, the, this is Eric, real, real quickly. The issue that I run into is that uh, I deal with companies and departments that are not used to design sprint design thinking at all 
and just the idea of bringing up problem framing, they immediately say, oh, well, that's not us. We don't, we don't do design, we don't do digital. And so I, I end up trying to name it different things because they need the product, but they hate the work. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions on that? Yeah, well, um, you don't have to call it, you don't have to call it anything. You can just call it a, um, a brainstorm. You know, it's funny what people like, what, how important language is to people. Um, well, it's not funny, it's, it's real. Um, so you can call it a session, you know, like what eventually tends to happen is that people get more familiar. So like, let them be where they are. You don't have to necessarily change them. They're already going to be uncomfortable, especially if you're doing it inside of Miro or mural on Zoom calls, like all this stuff, you're just making it, we make it more and more difficult for people to arrive. Right. So one-on-ones with people to describe what the process is going to feel like. Um, using different words, just calling it a brainstorm, calling it an ideation or a co-creation session, um, but making sure that uh, I always say the worst part about this, the design sprint is the name because everyone has right. this very right. strong reaction to the word design. Design is like a, a, a loaded word. So I'm a software engineer as, as um, that was my skill set coming into it. And the first time I heard design sprint, I was like, why would why would we invite our clients to a design sprint when our designers just do that? So I had the same exact reaction. And so like just allowing people to limp into the process and starting small, but doing your work as a facilitator and an organizer to help them understand who should be there and what, how they're going to contribute to the conversation. And right. even just to say like, so this is very separate. Um, this is a strategic conversation all the design work about like the interface and how it will look, how it will function, that's gonna happen later. But this conversation is gonna help all that work speed up in, in, down the road. So your participation is really important so, so that the designers and the, and the product people and all the digital and all those folks that are gonna come in to implement these ideas know exactly where we're coming from. And that way we have your input from the start. A lot of people too, um, stakeholders, executives, it works sort of in reverse. They, they get frustrated if people start building things without having their input. So making sure that it's clear, like, you know how you wanted to spend 30 minutes and only had a, a short amount of time for us, this brainstorm or this workshop that we're gonna do together will actually allow you to tell the team exactly what's important to you. And don't worry about drawing. Don't worry about being an artist. None of that stuff is going to be really important. Just sharing your ideas with the team. Right. Perfect. Thanks. You know, and even doing like, um, sometimes I've done like awareness. What I would, I wouldn't call it this to the group, but I would, I would call it like an awareness workshop. So I would do a, a 60 minute, a 90 minute, just sketching activity, very light and fun allowing people to like draw their neighbor, like draw bad ideas. Bad ideas is a fun experiment to do with, with folks just so they, they get some of that muscle memory built up for them. And then by the time, you know, like it's such a new and interesting activity, half the time Miro and Mural sell the workshop and the sprint in itself because they're just like, oh, this is really different, you know, like, and so just allowing them that small, safe uh, place to see what it's going to feel like. And then they, they're, most of the time, they're a lot more willing to come to the sprint. Cool. Thanks for asking, Aaron. Do you mind if I chime in just briefly, Jay? One thing that I've found yeah. helps when I'm help you know with stakeholders that aren't sure why we need to frame the problem differently um, is often the problems that problem statements or problems they're trying to solve are really business focused. And if I tell them, look, we need to reframe this problem so it's um, you know, consumer or customer user focused challenge, they can kind of get their head around that. So, you know, it, that's really only part of the reframing, but that's a piece that I've seen the light bulb go on, okay, right, we're trying to be customer centric. So we mm -hmm. need to reframe this problem so that we're, we're solving a, a, not a business challenge, but a, a user challenge. That's a good one. You know, a lot of groups talk about being customer focused, but they're not even sure what that looks like. So like, this is your chance. We can be customer focused in, in a highly structured framework. I like that one. 
cool. Okay. So let's see. Um, I'm going to take this one. What research do you bring to inform the participants? I'm just going to show you something. Um, let's see. These are the templates in the toolkit. One of them is called discovery. So the, the question that comes up a lot for me is what's the right starting point? And it's, it's never the same for two, group, for two different groups because some folks, this is a totally new space and they haven't spent any time talking to the market or getting familiar and they don't even know themselves what it looks like. So there's gonna be about a bunch of probing in the dark. Um, so even if we were to do stakeholder interviews or um, competitor analysis, there's just where to look for that is less clear. And then for others, it's right like the, the spectrum of innovation. It's this more incremental and they're trying to like improve. Our UX is broken. That, that was, those were a lot of the fun requests we used to get when we were design shop. Um, and so in that space, they have a lot of information. They have products, they have services, they have teams, they have scripts, they have surveys. And so like, where can we begin the conversation? So in, in the former, you may just need to get yourself into the workshop itself because there just is no research that's been collected and done. And the conversation itself of a problem framing workshop, if you were to follow the process that I use, would allow that information and the gaps of what you don't know to become more evident. And then you can pause the conversation or you can go through the workshop itself and then have these milestones that you have to do next. Okay, we had this conversation about the persona, but it was clear that we were all guessing. So research team or person that knows the most about research, go and spend like a day or two days talking to folks, validating some of these assumptions. So you'd have these um, it would be more clear what, what kind of research you should gather so that you can do the framing workshop again, perhaps, or take that and framing outputs and go into a sprint or some kind of like ideation session. So that's more of like blank slate. But if you know some, if the, if leadership understands where the trends are happening in the industry, if there's, if there's a lot of entrenched competition, um, if you've already built some products and services, that's when you would have more information that you bring into a framing workshop because, um, and there's a balance to this, right? We don't want to spend three weeks to be prepared for a one day workshop, right? So we don't want to go to the other extreme, but you do want to talk to people because those people may not be able to join because they may have information that is just important for the rest of the team to understand. And then the team can go and have that conversation. Um, so the more you take into it, the less guesswork, the less bias, the less assumptions you do in your framing session. And so like the way that I do things is I'll talk to, I'll single out three or four, maybe five stakeholders. Most of the time there are people that there's like one of them will be the person that is the, the charter, the person that was like, or that reached out to me to come and organize the session and have the, the largest vision. So understanding from them what's important, um, what should we be talking about? What are the trends? What should we avoid talking about? Right? So I'll have that one-on-one -on -one with them. But then I'll also ask who else should be part of this conversation that will be really difficult to be, to be in the room with us. Um, so senior leadership, C-suite that only give us like 30 minutes or so, and I'll make sure to go and talk with them and gather up. I'll record the session if they let me, and then otherwise I'm uh, synthesizing what I heard from them. And that becomes sort of like an internal set of information. Internal meaning like, what did I learn about in terms of anything other than the market itself, the, the use of the customer? And I'll gather that up for people and I'll share it with the team in pre-work so that they can see some of it. And then I'll kick off the workshop by going through it, making sure everyone's clear on what's been on what's been collected so far. So that's one set of research. And then the other set is this sort of like amorphous market research bucket that I'll do. So any kind of qual or quant research that's been done already. Um, I always tell people I'm not a trained researcher, so I just get as much information as I can, or a lot of the time I partner with the existing research team. So do they have personas? Do they have surveys they've done? Any kind of research that we can pull in 
And then again, sharing that with the team before the workshop so that even if they don't go through everything in detail, it's organized for them. So if we have to go back to it during the session, we have a place that's captured and we can go back to it. And then any industry research, competitive white papers. So that's the universe of research that I would bring in a framing workshop where the space is somewhat defined. If it's completely undefined, like I said, then we would just get into the workshop as best we can. I might still talk to some stakeholders to understand why are we doing this? Why now? What's important to talk about? What's important to avoid? But otherwise we would get in the session. Does anyone have any follow-up on that? Let's see. Oh, Marge asked a question. I know this one is new because Marge was gonna join today. I'm not, I don't know if she can make it. Um, so let's do this one. When do you perform customer, okay. When do you perform customer research in problem framing? So before, um, for the most part, if like I just said, to build on that last question, if I have it, I'll, I'll organize it, I'll gather it up. Most of the time it's the designers and the researchers on the team that have it. Um, and I'll organize as best I can, ask them to design that so that it's something that people can look at, understand quickly, build on top of it. What I'm not gonna bring into a, a, a one day workshop are 100 slide deck, 100 slide decks uh, and have the researchers sit there and drone on for an hour. That's not gonna be helpful. It's gonna kill the momentum. So what can we pull out of that and design so that people can look at it, understand it and have a conversation about it. Um, there was another thing I wanted to mention. Okay, and so that's beforehand, whatever I can organize and share with the team in pre-work and leading up to the workshop and then kicking it off to remind people we're here to talk about this persona. This is what their journey looked like. Otherwise, if we don't have that and that's part of the conversation, then like I mentioned earlier, what we might do is do our best to guess or assume what the current persona's challenge is, what their what their what their feeling is like, what their experience is like. And then I even do things like color coding stickies. Let me just show you quickly what I mean by that. So there's one place in my process where we do a proto persona. You see how this is like zoomed out purples and blues. So the purples are, are things that we believe to be facts about our, our proto persona and the blues are assumptions. So if this whole thing is filled and people lie. They, you know, things that are assumptions, they turn into facts. But overall, if we zoom out on this proto persona and we see that it's filled with lots of assumptions, that's a red flag that I'd say we did well, but let's go back and talk with five people to qualify that this is actually, you know, our understanding matches their actual experience. And so then during or after the workshop itself, I would then go and do some additional research and then bring that back to the team to let them know if anything's changed. So before, during and after perhaps. Anyone have any other ideas on that one? Hi, Jay. This yeah. is Marge here. I actually, oh, hey, you're here. I couldn't I see am. You. I managed. No, sorry. I, I, I was extremely late because I, I was, uh, there was some other priorities at work that, that I kind of had to attend to. But uh, I just jumped in just before you took my call. So I, I had a follow-up question. Yeah, so shoot. it's perfect timing that I got in. Um, so so you say you we bring whatever research we can into problem framing so um so you you mentioned a proto persona uh so then if if we use a proto persona when do we actually do you know uh, extensive customer research you know like doing interviews and you know observing if when when we're back in you know when we're back doing in-person interviews and whatnot like um because from what i've learned from design thinking like 
you do like you do spend a lot of time in you know customer research and it kind of aligns with what you're saying that we do want to spend more more time on in understanding the problem so if we are you know if we're bringing some research into problem framing um so when do we actually get to do like you know like user interviews and customer interviews and whatnot do we do that before we even start the problem framing workshop or after yeah and i think you you missed um and by all means i'm going to record this but i'm going to say it again just i'm going to summarize okay, what i said right before you joined okay was, depending on what you know about the space if it's a total black box and it's a new space for you then you it might be more difficult for you to even know who to be talking to and what kind of research. Mm -hmm. If there, if the team has some expertise in, in the company, in the organization, and you already have some of that information, so surfacing it to the team, because this mm -hmm. is really about like the team having a shared level of understanding about what the experience is like, who's experiencing it, how that experience may or may not be broken for them today, where there are opportunities. Right, so it's allowing the team to have that sort of like uh, level footing so that everyone as they move forward into the ideation space has a, the same shared understanding of what it's like today. Okay. Um, beyond that, I would say, you know, research is a, a fairly subjective conversation. So some groups demand that like I've run many sprints Mm -hmm. um, where the stakeholder, we present them with the ideas and the stakeholders that are, you know, in charge of approval of budgets and whatever happens next, they are expecting the group to then go and, and truly qualify. The, I'll hear things like, well, you learn from five people, that's nice, but we have to go and talk to like far more people before we invest in this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where quantitative can be a part of the conversation. So mm -hmm. after a sprint and you've kind of done some qualitative understanding of your ideas, mm -hmm. uh, you may do some more. Other teams feel like they've got enough information um, and that married it with other information that they already have that they're ready to, to move forward and start to build out their ideas that they learned in the sprint. Mm -hmm. That's why I say it's, it's fairly subjective. Mm. Okay, so then one, another follow-up question. So if, let's say for example, you know, as, as you and I have had conversations about this before, you know, like this is going to be something like our, our organization is very new to, and I've, I've only, I've introduced design thinking into our, in our agency. And so if, and I want to start kind of talking to people and introducing the concept of problem framing. So then if, because we are so new to this, uh, do we start and we start a problem framing session? Do we, obviously we, we've got some internal research, like our internal stakeholders kind of have an idea, a little bit of the problem space. Do we bring that into a problem framing session? And then after the problem framing session, can we spend more than two weeks doing customer research? Um, or can we spend a little bit more time and then start start the design sprint? Does that make sense, my question? Um, it does, but I don't know if I can answer it because only you know what you know about the space itself. And so like, what I'll tell you is this, okay. I think going through it once or twice is really important because what you'll learn is what you should have spent more time on and what you should have spent less time on. So oh, okay. in other words, um, what we were talking about earlier is this idea of spending three weeks of doing research and one-on-ones and whatever else you would do beforehand in order to have a six hour workshop or a one day workshop. And mm -hmm. so that feels out of balance mm -hmm. as opposed to what can we learn by having the conversation itself and then back up and say, okay, we are missing this, this, and this, but we learned these things. So that's great. Let's, let's do it again, or let's go over here based on what we learned in this session. So that's where you have like this, you have to almost build up um, the muscle memory yourself about how the conversation is gonna unfold, who's gonna be part of that, um, what gaps you were unsure of, what your blind spots were, 
and what, how you, how you want to run the next one altogether. Because the way that I do it is the way that I do it. And the conversations that I have in this specific context make sense for that group. But for another group, it doesn't make sense. And I have to spend much more time preparing with them. So that's mm -hmm. just something I would encourage you to like go through it yourself to organize. Mm -hmm. um, I forget. Uh, someone, man, hold on. What was her name? I'm blanking. Eric, I think, from New York was asking about um, getting people into the room and using like different language just to make sure that people feel safe enough to attend. So like doing some experimentation with how framing is going to go for you and how design thinking as a, as a mindset and a practice is going to feel in the team mm -hmm. and getting them comfortable with it is just going to be something that you experiment with. I'm not sure that anything I give as a prescriptive answer would would always apply, you know, across the board. Oh, okay, I understand. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Marge. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Erica, I think your question is in here. Is this a new one? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, well, let's see. How do you help teams estimate anticipated effort and impact of problems? Yeah, okay. Um, I found this question, I think, after we ended the last workshop. And uh, now I forget how I answered this. So I think what Erica's talking about is there's this space in framing where we do this thing, right? So just as a quick zoom out, we figure out, OK, what are all the potential things we want to talk about? I'm going at light speed here. Um, what's like the cluster that makes most sense sense to us based on why we're here, why we organized, what like level of complexity of problems do we want to solve? And then you've got like, say, you've gone from, let's say 50 opportunities down to 10 or 12. And now you're in this space here where you're going to try to pick one to, to continue on with. And I use a two by two to figure that out. And I do that by having a relative conversation of the relative impact of each problem versus their relative difficulty or effort. Um, and so in order to answer this, in order to answer how much impact would it have to solve this problem and what would be the effort required to solve it, you have to spend, you have to open the door to solutioning. And it's, or this is where it gets tricky because this is where if you don't hold tight, the conversation can really spiral because especially if you've got like engineers in the room, we're the worst. As soon as you like open up the door to solutioning, we like, we just want to run with that because that's where we feel safe. Um, and so just really framing it, I, I'm not going to have the, um, the most magical answer here, but I do a lot to say we're, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes going through 10 or 12 problems. And in order to answer it, we have to just quickly imagine what the future would look like if we were to solve this thing. What I don't want to have is a conversation on what that solution is and what it will look like, how it will function. I just want us to imagine as, as in the most brief sense as we can, what it would feel like for the market if we were to solve this thing. And it's not, like I said, it's not perfect. Most people are like, well, we have to talk about what the solution would look like, right? So like there's this balancing act back and forth of allowing them just to, like I think I described, just to like dip a toe in the water of solutioning just so that people can talk about it. Um, and like I always tell people, it's a relative conversation. So you don't have to know precisely how it's gonna be solved, but you just have to know if we were talking about two problems, what I mean by relative is does this problem, would solving this problem be more or less impactful than solving this other problem? And, and the group says like, um, hmm, okay, when you put it that way, probably it would create a lot more impact. Okay, fine, so this second problem is up here. And then you get them plotted on sort of that y-axis and you have this relative understanding of the different impact of all the different problems. And then you do the same thing with effort. By having that relative discussion, people are um, 
less fixated on having to know precisely what the solution will look like, right? They can just sort of imagine. I found that, that it is more helpful. And then I drag this thing in here to help them have a conversation about um, deciding what ultimately they want to take forward. This thing has been magical as well to help, right? And you get all your problems plotted and you can start to see what are the things that we should be investing in. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, I really love that um, second framework that you just showed. I've used it a lot. So thank you for that. Um, I think it's the difficulty access that I, I find particularly I worked with a lot of, you know, digital product teams. And so, you know, talking, you're right, it's always the engineers in the room. Well, I don't know what I'm building. So how do I tell you what the difficulty even relative to something else? Um, impact seems a little easier but yeah the difficulty question always throws me because you're right we don't actually know what the solution is so um uh, i think just leaning into that relative question you know the, the relativity of the solutions is, is where i'm gonna have to really focus those conversations yeah um that's something i learned from um mark tippen at mural Mm -hmm. um, which he learned while spending time teaching as part of Luma and when he was working at Autodesk. Um, so I watched him do that and it was definitely a different conversation. Just, I, th I think what it does is the um, making it more of a relative conversation gives people a sense of safety that they're not going to be evaluated. Because if they were, if you were to say like, if you were to rate them, where right, as an engineer, when people would ask me for estimates, and they do this like these cards like low medium hot high whatever it was. or whatever yeah yeah i would feel like that's going to get saved and there's going to be this whole thing and then i'm going to be getting trouble when it's when yeah. something that was simple became hard right instead it's more like this thing is going to be probably more challenging to solve than this thing mm -hmm. that's it and we end the conversation there okay great thanks so much jay yeah Let's see. Ooh, whoa, this is a new one. How do you handle detractors who are more powerful than you? Hmm, this is a good one. Um, I learned from my buddy, Daniel Stillman. Uh, I'm not gonna remember what his name is. Um, David. I'm going to, I'm going to follow up and I'll add this as a note in the follow up. Um, there's a guy that studied or created a field called structural dynamics. And what he talked about are these four, three archetypes that show up anytime more than two people are talking, you have the person who has the idea and I'm forgetting all of the naming to this. Um, I can, if you go to, if you sign up for my free facilitation mini course, I think I unpack this in there. Um, so there's the person who has the idea, maybe they're the leader or something. And then you have the follower. So that's the person. And the example that I give in the course that I heard somewhere else is talking about going to the movies. So if I were the leader, I'd say, let's go to the movies tonight. And then the follower in the room says, that's a great idea. It is four archetypes. And then there's an opposer in the room. And the opposer says, we just went to the movies or we shouldn't go to the, <laughs> I'm realizing the timing of things. We shouldn't go to the movies because COVID. Um, and so like, if you just have those three, then what happens is the person with the idea and the follower can overrule the, um, the opposer. Right, and in that case, you don't get to surface what that person was questioning. And if they're jerks, then you're probably gonna even more quickly stuff them down because you don't feel like dealing with that. But the, the magic people in the room are what I think are referred to as bystanders. And so as a facilitator, your job of activating those bystanders by saying, um, what are you seeing? Or what are you thinking? And allowing them to say like, well, she's right, 
we did go to the movies or there is COVID, but um, we can all get rapid tests and we can all wear masks. Um, and there is a new movie that came out that we all were talking about that we're all excited. And so like just by you calling on those people, then you kind of like make it a more even conversation as opposed to like two people overruling the one person because the opposer is actually, and I'm not sure if this is how you define detractor, but the opposer, I'm just assuming that you mean opposer, the opposer is, is actually really, really important to the conversation because without them, you go from sort of like how things work today to how you want them to work in the future without really um, abstracting and understanding the differences of how people think and how people arrive at different solutions and experiences. And the opposer and the person that's willing to be courageous to ask good questions is often how you have those unlocking moments. And you as a facilitator can um, help, that, help that sort of unfold and take place by activating those bystanders in the room. And they're often like the quiet people that won't say anything unless you call on them. So detractors or opposers are important. I'm not sure if the person that asked that question is here, if they wanna like come back and ask more questions or did you mean opposer or somebody else? Yeah, that was me. Um, I think that's super helpful. I think what I've encountered are um, people who are opposed to the process itself who think like, you know, mm -hmm. I, for example, I work in healthcare and it's like, well, healthcare is special health. Like I know everything there possibly could be to know. And this is just a waste of time, that kind of detractor. Mm -hmm. And when it's, I'm often coming in as the design facilitator. And when it's say the president of the company, it's really difficult for me to be like, no, <laughs> like this is valuable or, you know, please engage. And so a little different than how you were kind of defining it. Yeah. Um, yes, maybe, maybe it's different or maybe the process is, is the product itself at some points. Like my product tends to be like what I sell is my ability to come and lead a, a sprint or uh, a brainstorm or a workshop. So that almost is my product and I have to help people feel safe enough or committed to, to let me come and do it and to spend money paying me to come and do it. Um, and they are detractors at first. So like the way that I've done it, which probably won't work for you in a workshop is to educate them and let them naturally understand it in their own context. So using words like we were talking about at the start, using words that they're comfortable with, um, allowing them to read it and understand it and unpack it in, in their own setting. So like, like I said, that's not gonna help you in, in, in the moment in a workshop, but I've created like content videos and workshops that are just designed to allow people to experiment in a safe and fun environment before like the real work starts to happen. So if you can design like the fun conversation and session so that people, the detractors see that um, the soft things, the things that they wouldn't have expected. Seeing two people in a room that are not normally in a room excited to be sharing ideas together. Those are like the magical moments where you can be like, we're gonna do more of this. Like what I'm trying to do is to create um, activities and a place where more of this can happen because what what we want to avoid is like one person comes in the room and they, we hear all their ideas, but we don't get to hear everybody else's ideas. So why even have them? So just letting people see those, those things that they're going to get out of the session itself. Those are like softer outcomes that they weren't, they weren't, um, they weren't like front and center for them. I don't know if those are helpful either. That is helpful. Thank you. A lot of it is, <laughs> A lot of it too is just being courageous enough to stand in what you believe. Um, because once you've seen it, then you know what's going to happen in the room. And so like even you just telling your stories about what you've experienced, a lot of the time me telling how like I was the biggest antagonist against sprints when, when I learned about them in the company, I was like, waste of time. Let's, let's stop talking about them. So me telling my, like, I get it, I've been there, I understand what you're worried about. 
um, and helping them just have that like shorter experience. Um, one of the videos I just recorded with Doug Powell, he talks about IBM's eight year journey through like taking in design thinking and having these magic people that have these aha moments. They tend to be these like engineers in the room that are like, oh, I can use this. I can like, I get, I get why I'm here. I get how I can use this. So, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Great question. Let's see, 12.55. I'll do one more and then I'll jump out and then we can do this again in a couple of weeks. Um, does anyone have, these questions are here, but I think I answered them last time. So does anyone have any question that they wanna jump in and ask spend the last few minutes on? Jay, this is Marge again. Um, do you have like a, you know, because you're you're running these AMAs, do you have like a like a Slack channel or something where people who've taken your courses can just kind of jump in and kind of you, like a community of <laughs> you know learners? You, you're uh, you're in my brain, Marge. Um, just <laughs> be, just before this. Um, the reason I'm doing this, these Miro boards is um, a, another woman gave, us, gave me this idea to record them and just share them. Um, so what I'm trying to do is like democratize what I know about this stuff instead of you having to go through a course or anything like that. I do have a Slack group. Um, I'm just a one, I'm like a one person band. So um, what I, I've i always been holding back opening up the Slack group because I don't want it to be this like dead community. I'm, I'm a part of so many Slack groups where it's just like tumbleweeds. So it's something I'm thinking about. Maybe I did just get the help of a young man. Maybe he can help me do that because I also don't want it to just be the sage on the stage kind of stuff. So like, I love if we keep doing these and other people are like, I want to come and talk about this topic and I want to answer this question and that's great. And I can just like host these events for other people to come and share. Less work for me. Cool. So <laughs> uh, I am thinking about it. I just want to figure out a way to make it sustainable and something we can do. What I will do though is I'll, I'll, I'll send out a follow-up. I do have a Slack group that I post events and certain things like that. So I'll share it with you all. And um, if it turns into something bigger and more of like a, an active community, that would be awesome. I would love that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be down for something like that. <laughs> and yeah. if you need help, I yeah I'm more than willing to help. I always need help. <laughs> Thanks, help. Jay. Well, um, there's only a couple minutes left, so if anything didn't get answered, I want to let y'all go. And. Um, my nine-year-old just got home from school, so I'm gonna go see him. So if any questions come up or anything that I said, you just didn't feel comfortable asking or you wanna wait till a follow-up session, drop it in this board here or get in touch with me. Let me just put my, uh, my email out there for you guys to get in touch. Like I said, um, follow New Haircut on LinkedIn or Twitter or if you're part of the newsletter, I'll, I'll try to keep keep these things rolling and I'll do them every couple of weeks or so. So if you couldn't, if you didn't get an answer to your question today, sorry about that. And I'll try to get it into the next one. But thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jay. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.